Hi, and welcome to the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. Today, we're going to take a look at uh, a microcontroller architecture. What does a microcontroller look like on the inside? How does it do? How does it do its thing? You know what happens. Um, before we get started, though, uh, a quick disclaimer that this is not meant to be a comprehensive um, look at a particular architecture because there's lots of different architectures. Uh, this is meant to be an overall look to kind of get you started to understand what you're looking at, to try and get a feel for what's happening. We're also going to touch uh, on some assembly and again, not meant to be a comprehensive guide for assembly. Just an overall top level look. So I know uh, microcontroller architecture is not a super sexy topic, but it's going to be a building block for uh, future things that we look at. And it's important to try and understand what's happening on the inside to, you know, build up to uh, some more advanced topics. The majority of microcontrollers are built using RISC. RISC stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer. Before we even start to dissect that, we need to talk about what an instruction is. An instruction is uh, something that tells uh, the core of either the microcontroller or computer or whatever uh, what to do. <clears throat> An instruction, uh, for example, one of the most basic instructions is add. You take two numbers and you add them together. That is an instruction. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of instructions. Uh, the reason why it's called the reduced instruction uh, set computer is that this has far fewer instructions than its brother, which is the, uh, the R is replaced with a C, and it is the complex instruction set computer. So uh, if you own a laptop, a desktop, anything that's been made in the last 20 plus years, you know, something beefier, it's uh, something that has like a, a Pentium or a Core, you know, Core 2 Duo, Core 2 Quad, Core i7, Core i5, Core i3, you know, uh, any of the AMD processors, the Phenoms, the Athlons, the uh, Ryzen's, which are you know, fairly new now, they all use the complex instruction set. But a microcontroller is simpler, and so it doesn't need as many instructions, and so it uses the reduced instruction set. The upside of the reduced instruction set is because there are not as many instructions, the silicon of the chip is substantially simpler. <clears throat> the drawback to a uh, RISC core is that uh, where a CISC core can perform an operation in a single, a certain operation in a single instruction, a RISC core may need two or three or five instructions to perform that same kind of operation because the instructions are simpler. Now, an instruction describes to you what you want to do, what you want to do it on, and what happens after you're done, so to speak. So the example I gave was add. So the add instruction would be Add. And uh, back before even assembler, where you actually had to program the computer, or, my, or I guess microcontrollers wouldn't have existed back then, but when you had to program a computer, uh, this add instruction would translate to some sort of a number, uh, something in hex, etc. And by looking at the instruction, you'd be able to tell, oh, that's an add, you know, uh, A3 is an add instruction, you know, just as a a very broad example. <clears throat> but when we uh, went to assembler, assembler uh, gave you one level of obscure uh, obfuscation from machine code. And so you could use an instruction like add to add two numbers together. 
in reality uh, there's probably some sort of a suffix behind that because you can have a whole bunch of different kinds of ads you can add integers you can add unsigned things you can you know etc just for the purposes of example again this is not a comprehensive course on assembly we're just going to say the instruction is add after the instruction you can pass uh, into the instruction between 0 and 3 parameters or variables or whatever you want to call it. But anyway, so when you add things, you always have to add two things together. So the first and second thing are the things that you're adding together. And so let's say S1, comma S2 are the things you want to add together. And then after you're done adding them, you have to store the results somewhere. And then that becomes, let's say, comma S3. And uh, there might be a semicolon, there might not be. I'm not super familiar with assembly. I'm just kind of dipping my toe in with the rest of you guys. But this is kind of what the instructions will look like. So, uh, the add instruction is probably the easiest one to understand. Uh, the simplest instruction you can have is uh, NOP. It's no operation. NOP. Uh, the no operation um, instruction doesn't get anything passed in and the no operation instruction basically just wastes the processor's time by um, just not doing anything. So now that we've gotten that basic introduction out of the way, let's start taking a look at what's actually inside the core of the processor. And so let's draw the core. as a big box. So uh, the very first thing in the core that I'd like to mention is the program counter. And we're going to draw that also as a box sitting over here. It's going to be abbreviated PC. The program counter is what keeps track of where in a program you are. And uh, this program counter is very, very important to how the core operates because the program counter is what tells the core what to do next. <clears throat> After the program counter, probably the next thing of importance, and I'm not really doing them in order, just kind of as they come up, is the decoder. Put that down here. I'm going to abbreviate the decoder as DEC. I, you know, other people might abbreviate it differently. So after the decoder, we have um, uh, ALU. Oh, I couldn't think of the abbreviation there for a second. <clears throat> The ALU is the arithmetic and logic unit. Uh, if the decoder is the boss of the processor, uh, the decoder follows uh, the directions provided by the uh, program counter. The ALU is the brains because the ALU is then what does the addition, the subtraction, any kind of comparisons. And the reason I drew it the way I did, and I kind of like the way other books and things had drawn them, is it's sort of shaped like a V that's laying down on its side because it, the ALU has two inputs and one output because just about any operation that you're going to do with the ALU is going to take two things and give you back one thing. Next, we have the working registers. And let's put them up here. WR, and there is a number of working registers. The working registers are sort of like the cache 
of the uh, core uh, because information is uh, written into and copied out of the working registers. The thing to understand about the working registers is that the core cannot perform an operation with the ALU on any kind of data unless it came out of the working registers. There are some very, very minor exceptions, but the working registers is where information is moved in and out of for operation. Uh, that's basically the uh, innards. Uh, where things get kind of mucked up a little bit is that uh, there's a whole bunch of interconnect in here with multiplexers and so there's kind of like little uh, multiplexers living on the side of each one of these things and then the uh, <clears throat> decoder has control of all of these multiplexers Because as I mentioned, the decoder is the thing that tells everything what to do. Uh, there are also uh, memory management type things, which are also effectively multiplexers. And I'm gonna draw them kind of here on the sides because next I'm gonna draw the memory. And so let's put the RAM over here. And you have a bunch of RAM and the decoder also tells the RAM what to do like that and in the RAM you have a bunch of different you know spaces to store things but I'm not gonna go through and well, actually what I will do is I will draw the RAM a little larger because we need to we will need to write some things in the RAM so let's make it Bigger like that, that looks a little bit nicer. <clears throat> but generally speaking, uh, the RAM is addressed and those addresses tend to go from something like, let's say zero X zero 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 to zero X F F F. Again, I'm not talking about a specific microcontroller architecture. I could, we could actually do the math and figure out how much RAM is in this thing, but it's a, it doesn't particularly matter. Just understand that the bottom of the RAM is the address 000, and the top of the RAM is the address FFF. Then finally, we have the program memory or the flash, and that sort of lives over here. Like that, the decoder also has <clears throat> control of it, but also the uh, program counter has an input into it as well. And then there's a link here. <clears throat> How things are physically addressed, again, varies. So lots of different uh, <clears throat> architectures, but uh, the uh, flash, Uh, tends to be addressed on top of the RAM and so the flash would be like 0 uh, x 0 0 1 0 0 0 which would be the next address location after FFF and then up here it's something like 0 x f f f f f that an FFs, right? F six, one, two, three, four, five. The no, more F, F like that. Now that we have the kind of general overview of what the innards look like, let's look at some basic instructions and what happens. I'd say uh, to as an example, let's do add. But we can't outright do add because as I mentioned, uh, things uh, can only be added together from the working registers. And so the working registers are like 
S1, S2, S3, S3, etc. <clears throat> and so before we can uh, add things in the working registers, we have to load things into the working registers. And so you have a command that's something like load. Again, there's a whole bunch of different variations on how things are done, etc. Again, it's, your mileage might vary depending on what kind of core you're using. And the load instruction is going to be something along the lines of a number, let's say five, and we're going to load it into S1. Like that. <clears throat> now, if we want to add things together, we always have to add two things. So we need a second load instruction. And let's we'll say we're going to add the number three to the number five, but we have to load it. And so the second instruction is going to be to load the number three into S2. Like that. <clears throat> and only then can we uh, add. Uh, S1 to S2, and we're going to store it in S3. So how does this work? Well, the first thing is that the architecture I drew here is called, this is a non-pipelined architecture. What that means exactly, I'm going to touch on toward the end after we finish most of our discussion, but uh, this architecture executes one instruction at a time. And so these instructions are now going to be sitting in our flash. So if this is instruction one, this is instruction two, and this is instruction three, they're going to be sitting as one, two, three in our flash. The program counter will already be holding the address for instruction one. And we'll talk more about how exactly that happens just a little bit later. Let's work our way through our first instruction uh, and see how this works. And so our first instruction uh, gets uh, commanded by the program counter. So effectively the program counter uh, will tell the uh, memory management here that I want instruction one out of my flash. And so the memory manager will make instruction one available to the decoder down here. And so uh, the program counter says, okay, give me instruction one. The memory then makes available out here instruction one. The decoder pulls it in and the decoding process effectively is the decoder looks at the instruction, so the slowed instruction translates into some ones and zeros, and per those ones and zeros, the decoder then configures the ALU, if necessary, the program counter, uh, the working registers, the RAM, anything of the sort to accept what the following information is and in this case it will configure the working registers to copy to load the number five from the flash to the working register and so after the first instruction the working register gets s1 gets the number five stored in it <clears throat> the in a core like this, generally this happens over multiple clock cycles. It tends to be four clock cycles. And so the first clock cycle makes the memory available. The second clock cycle, the decoder pulls it in. The third clock cycle, the decoder configures everything and moves stuff around. And the fourth clock cycle, the program counter uh, increments. Something like that. So I'm, I'm very vaguely paraphrasing here. But so uh, at the end of this instruction, the program counter automatically increments to the next instruction. And again, depending on the architecture, uh, that will dictate how much the program counter increments, depending on how things are addressed, etc. So 
we're just using kind of a generic one, two, three. So if we started with one, now the program counter has two in it. So now the program counter tells the memory that, hey, we want to grab instruction two. And the same kind of workflow happens again. Instruction two is pulled into the decoder. The decoder configures all the different methods to go that we need to move the number three in copy out of our flash and move it to working register S2. And so working register S2 now has the number three in it. <clears throat> and then the program counter will increment again to three and we get to our third instruction, which is add. And with our add instruction here, uh, add says take S1, add it to S2 and store it in S3. And so what happens is, again, the add instruction per the program counter is pulled into the decoder. The decoder then configures the working register. So the working registers will now deposit their information into the ALU and the ALU once it's added the numbers together because the decoder also commanded the ALU that hey ALU you're going to be adding things and so the ALU adds its two inputs and then the output is deposited back into the working registers which again the decoder has configured to receive the output of the ALU into S3 and that will be 8. And this kind of process repeats in the microcontroller instruction per instruction per instruction, you know, until the end of the program or until it loops in on itself, et cetera. So where things start to become interesting is when you have more complex interactions between your flash your core and your RAM. And let's take a closer look at what happens in your RAM. The example we just looked at just moved things from the flash to the working registers, and that's about it. But a lot of the magic actually happens in the RAM. Uh, unlike um, what Harvard and Princeton architectures, uh, this uh, processor, this core, does not actually execute anything out of the RAM. It only executes things out of the flash. But in the RAM, the RAM is broken down into some distinct sections. At the bottom of the RAM, because the addresses are at the bottom, it's drawn in a particular way, you have a section that's dedicated to global uh, and static variables. <clears throat> now, Technically speaking, uh, there's, uh, this section is actually two pieces. Uh, one is for initialized and one is for non-initialized, but I really don't want to split hairs on that at the moment. And so uh, anything that is global or static, meaning that it will exist for the entire life of the program, start to finish, sits down here at the bottom of the RAM. <clears throat> the next thing after that is the heap. Generally speaking, not a whole lot of programs actually use the heap outright. You might have some libraries that are using the heap in the background without you knowing it. But the heap is where variables go that are declared on the fly without a known size at compile time is the, the technical definition. But anytime you're using things like alloc, malloc, free, etc., that stuff goes in the heap. In a microcontroller, the heap tends to be a fixed size, whereas in a computer program, something you know, something that's written uh, for a a CISC computer, uh, the heap can actually change size. And then finally, uh, you have the stack. Now the stack uh, really gets interesting, and we'll take a much closer look at the stack. Uh, the stack starts at the top of the RAM and works its way down. And I'm going to draw the stack with a dashed line. 
because the stack does not have a fixed size. I mean, there are some limits and restrictions, etc. But the stack can move around. This line can shift either this direction in this direction. And uh, whenever you hear of like a stack collision, what happens is that the stack grows so large that it either collides with the heap or this uh, global static section and the memory gets all garbled. And so it's important to note that you never want the stack to grow too large. You want the stack to comfortably exist in this area and just kind of move around up and down. I did want to mention that in the case of the microcontroller architecture I drew, the stack resides in the RAM. There are some much smaller architectures where the stack actually has its own separate section to do stack type things and the RAM is uh, only for variable storage. But again, your mileage might vary depending on how <clears throat> uh, the microcontroller architecture that you're using is designed. So uh, let's talk more about the stack. I guess we already talked about the stack, but the stack, the reason why its size varies is because the stack will store things that uh, can happen dynamically in your code. So for example, any variables that uh, aren't on the heap uh, or in the global static area can end up in the stack. How that happens is uh, in the stack, you have variables that are called auto, automatic variables. And so if you have a function, for example, let's say void func uh, int a, just as an example, <clears throat> int a is considered an auto variable. It's auto because it's automatically created. And after you don't need it anymore, at the end of func, the variable is destroyed. How that happens is the stack has a stack pointer. Uh, the stack pointer, um, trying to think of a nice way to draw that. Let's put a box. And here, SP. The stack pointer also plugs into the controller for the RAM, and the stack pointer tells uh, you where the stack currently is. <clears throat> for a function that just has one variable that's passed into it, uh, this is fairly easy for uh, a compiler to translate to uh, the language of the microcontroller, what would happen with this is that uh, what you would get is a uh, store command. So if you were to kind of deconstruct this, it would be something along the lines of store um, let's say S1 uh, to the stack. And actually, uh, let me erase that here for a second because I did forget an operation. <clears throat> so uh, before we store something, we have to uh, give space to it on the stack. And so actually this would be add the stack pointer to, and this is important, so let's say it's a 32-bit int, and we're gonna move the stack pointer down four bits. To move the stack pointer down, we're actually gonna add a negative four to the stack pointer, because we actually have to subtract from the stack pointer to make it go down this way, because the stack pointer is at the top of the stack, it's the height address, and we're gonna store it um, back in the stack pointer, like that. <clears throat> so now that we've done this, we've moved the stack down this, this way, 
and now we have the room in the stack to store something and so now we can store let's say the number from s1 um, to the uh, do, do, do. Uh, we want to place it in the stack, but we want to place it in the empty spot that we uh, provided. And the empty spot actually begins at 4SP. And what this means is this is like a little subroutine that basically says that uh, uh, store it in the uh, stack uh, pointer location plus 4. And so what this does is it takes the stack pointer, which has moved this way, adds four to it, which moves it back up this way to the location of where uh, you made the space, and then it will fill in that space. <clears throat> and so now that we perform this operation for the remainder of this uh, func function, S1 now serves the placeholder for int A. When, and I guess I should mention that this is assuming that uh, S1 can hold a 32-bit number. If you have, let's say, an 8-bit architecture, uh, you could have a situation where you need S1, S2, S3, and S4 to store <clears throat> the uh, full 32-bit number, etc. Let's say, I'm trying not to really get down into the mud here, but it's a, uh, this for the remainder of uh, funk, S1 stands as a placeholder for int A. And so any kind of operations that are performed in the function until the end of the function are done using S1. When the function finishes, kind of as the cleanup for the function, what will happen is a load will happen. So some stuff happens here, some... And so you will get a load of doo -doo -doo, uh, 4 SP to S1. And so what the load will do is that now that we've finished our function, the load will uh, move the thing that we saved to the stack back into our working register. And uh, to finish everything up, we're going to add to the uh, service pack, I'm sorry, to the, not service pack, to the stack pointer, to uh, do, do, do four, and we're going to store it back into the uh, stack pointer. And what that does is it uh, now moves our uh, stack pointer back up this way to uh, uh, that to uh, remove the things that were in the stack before. And so the variable that uh, was stored in the stack is now effectively gone because the stack pointer now is ignoring everything that's underneath where the stack ends. Before we get too far away, I wanted to reiterate that we are sort of mixing here uh, C and uh, assembly and the this assembly sort of represents what the C would be doing. So this is what you would refer to as the disassembly of it. But you wouldn't outright use this C and this assembly together at the same time. Now that that's out of the way, uh, another thing that the stack does is the stack keeps track of uh, where you're at in the code. And what I mean by that is when you do have a function you know, such as func. Uh, the function is often used multiple times throughout the code. And so for efficiency, what you do is you store the function somewhere in the flash up here, and then you reference to it every time you need to use it. 
And the mechanism for referencing that is called a jump. Erase that. So a jump would occur if you're running through your code and you hit this function. To effectively execute this function, you have to jump to the function. But to jump to the function, you have to store the program counter that you were at before. That way you know where to return to in the code. Uh, the, the, yeah, so uh, to store the program counter works exactly like we did with the variable that we do a uh, what store and uh, we ooh, I'm sorry of course I have to screw that up. Uh, first we do an add. of the uh, stack pointer and we do a negative, I don't, I don't know, let's say the, the uh, program counter is two bytes and so two and then we store that back into the stack pointer that will move the stack pointer down. We store, so now, uh, then we store the, um, program uh, counter um, into the stack. So it's going to be 2SP, which is stack pointer plus 2, which puts you back up into the stack where the spot is. We do our business with the function. We, uh, I guess technically then we load, oh, sorry, jump. jump and then something into PC something so we know what the um, uh, memory address of the of the function is and so we jump I guess to I mean that'll be a little more representative funk so we jump to the function <clears throat> and after we're done we now have to um, load um, the uh, program counter back into the register and jump back effectively. Uh, the jump function basically just rewrites the program counter and said you can do this jump action with functions all around the flash to jump to the different functions that you need. Um, in like a C type language, something like jump is generally frowned upon. It's like a go to because they're very difficult to uh, debug. But whenever you go from C to assembler, a jump function is perfectly acceptable because there's no other way to get around because you're at the very lowest level. But um, at that point, when you're going from C to assembler, the compiler is putting all of the jump, uh, jump type functions in for you. The next sort of thing to cover is called a branch. Whereas a jump function jumps you around in the flash, you don't always necessarily know where in the uh, flash stuff is going to be. And that's where a branch function comes in handy. A branch function is typically used for um, the, some sort of comparison, uh, a conditional statement. So if then else. So if a is greater than B and then you do some stuff else you do some other stuff so a branch happens at one of these conditional statements there are lots of branches and those branches uh, are basically the different 
comparisons. Less than, greater than, less than, or equal to, uh, greater than or equal to, not equal to, equal to, etc. Those are all the comparisons and those are kind of all the different varieties of branches. And so the idea is that you can write the code in the sense of that, well, uh, if uh, A is greater than B, go ahead and jump to the location. And in, the, uh, in reality, uh, the code can actually end up sort of backwards from what you would expect it to, that if they're not equal, um, I'm sorry, if A is not greater than B, you end up executing the else, but the else ends up directly underneath the statement, but if A is greater than B, a branch will jump you to uh, the location of where just the if portion is. Oh, the thing that really makes the difference between a branch and uh, a, a jump is that a jump occurs to a specific memory location. A branch, on the other hand, and uh, similar to how we saw with the stack, a, a branch follows this, let's say, uh, uh, for PC uh, kind of style, where the branch will jump you four instructions further along than where the program counter is, which lets you skip some lines of code. Um, but uh, the branch doesn't know where it is in the code, it just knows that, well, I need to jump so many instructions ahead. Uh, similar to that if you um, were to write this with inverse logic, meaning that uh, if you have a branch that A is less than B, um, go ahead and do this section, but if A is not less than uh, B, go ahead and do this section. And when you get to the end of this section, you would use just a conditional branch kind of thing where uh, it would be a branch of just, let's say, you know, PC4, which would jump you over the else, that kind of thing. So branches allow you to do all of your conditional statements because uh, everything higher level than that, like your uh, fors, whiles, do whiles, are basically just built out of if statements. Now let's bring everything together. What happens when a microcontroller powers up? First, of course, you know, everything gains power and effectively the usually brownout reset will hold the microcontroller in a reset type state up until sufficient power is deemed, you know, that you have it. And so uh, the uh, uh, program here in the flash now has to prepare everything to run the program. And the first thing it has to prepare is it has to get all of your global and static variables set up. <coughs> to do this, and this is why I mentioned that uh, the memory here at the very beginning split into two sections. Those two sections are where the memory, uh, the first section is where the memory is initialized, meaning something is stored into it immediately as it's created. So if you have a global, let's say int i equals five, then this is an initialized variable. But if you have an int k, as a global, this is not an initialized variable. And so this first int i, as the program starts up, would get loaded into this memory. But actually, now that I think about it, I skipped a step. The, uh, generally, the very first instruction executed is a jump instruction. The jump instruction tells the program counter where we want to go. And that kind of mechanism, sometimes it's in software, sometimes it's in hardware, is uh, put in place for uh, the kinds of architectures where you can have a bootloader. Something that uh, starts the chip up before the main program starts that allows the chip to program. So in the case of that kind of architecture, what could happen is you can designate the backside of the flash here <coughs> 
as your boot area, like that. <clears throat> and so when the uh, whole thing starts up, this very first instruction tells the program counter to, to jump back here. The bootloader is executed, and once the bootloader is done, which if it's written to the memory or not written to the memory, regardless, it will then execute a jump instruction and change the program counter to basically go to the second instruction. And then you will run your program over and over again up until you reboot the microcontroller. <coughs> so once we've uh, gotten to the beginning of the memory here, now we start executing basically uh, load instructions to move stuff that's initialized from the flash into the first section of RAM. Once we do all that, we store the location of where uh, the main function is and we stick it on the stack. And now we start to execute all of our code. Basically, that's the boot sequence. Um, the, again, the <clears throat> The first set of variables is the initialized, and mind you, uh, as far as this section of memory here, nothing really keeps track of it for other than the addresses of where stuff is located is outright stored in the code. The heap, if you have a heap, will have like a, a manager in software that allows you to keep track of where stuff is in the heap, etc., so you don't write over top of stuff. And then the stack just naturally grows and shrinks as the program runs. The final topic I wanted to discuss are interrupts because interrupts actually uh, play a big role in uh, the operation of the core because an interrupt can happen at any time. It's triggered uh, through hardware externally, generally speaking. Uh, and what an interrupt will effectively do is it will stop the execution of the flash and jump to another section of code. Uh, the uh, interrupt controller inside of it or somewhere in memory will hold a table of uh, vector locations and those vectors are basically same as you would have with the function uh, a grouping of addresses that show you where to jump to for which particular interrupt. So when that interrupt occurs, the interrupt controller will wait for the particular current instruction to finish. <coughs> and then it will uh, take over the core. Uh, what effectively happens is the program counter is stored off and uh, the interrupt will jump to a location in memory and then as part of the interrupt routine the interrupt will then basically go through and save off all of the variables or it will retrieve from memory any variables that the interrupt might need and then the interrupt will modify those variables accordingly so for example if you have a timer and you're counting milliseconds you jump into the timer interrupt, you increment your milliseconds, you, you know, add one to it. And as I mentioned, you can only do that in the working registers, the math with the ALU, and then you would then store uh, the, uh, that number back to a variable, which with a uh, interrupt, the only way to move information in and out of the interrupt is using a global variable. So you would copy it into a working register, increment it by one and copy it back into the RAM. And then the uh, interrupt service routine cleans up. So it copies back to that number and anything else that it needs to. It resets your program counter and basically jumps you back into the program uh, where you were operating. Uh, it's very important to understand uh, what things are interruptible and what things aren't. So a single instruction is non-interruptible, but uh, instructions that can take um, uh, 
how would you put it? Uh, uh, operations that can take several instructions can be interruptible. And that's when you get into something called atomic access. And I'm just going to uh, touch on it very briefly. Uh, effectively, if you have something that takes multiple operations to complete, but you can interrupt it in the middle, you can have atomic access problems in that, let's say, you moderate, like you're doing some calculation that depends on how many milliseconds you have. And you start the calculation and you're going through and said it takes multiple instructions, but in the middle of that, the interrupt fires, the milliseconds is incremented, and then you drop back in. Well, now your second half of calculation is going to be done with the wrong milliseconds because you know in the first half you use one value but in the second half you're using that value plus one and so it's something to be aware of that a single instruction effectively is not interruptible but uh, something that takes multiple instructions can be interrupted and it can cause a problem so we've taken a look at what the innards of a microcontroller look like that the program counter keeps track of where in the flash you are. The decoder will grab an instruction from the flash, configure everything in the core to execute that one instruction, and then execute the instruction. And then uh, your RAM holds your global and static variables, your heap if you have one, and your stack, and that the stack can grow and shrink as the program runs and that if you don't if you aren't careful let's go with that you can have your uh, stack collide with your heap and basically your program crashes uh, we looked at how um, you deal with branch statements which uh, you deal I'm sorry you deal with conditional statements which are your branches uh, how you deal with functions, which are jumps, and how you deal with automatic variables, which basically store things off into the stack and use the <clears throat> uh, working registers to uh, store things, or even if uh, there are too many variables inside the functions to store in the working registers, you can uh, move stuff back and forth between the stack and the working registers to make sure that they're properly safe. That uh, if you like the video, please be sure to give me a thumbs up down below. So that, um, don't forget to subscribe. Uh, that always helps. And thank you for watching.